You'll see in your bulletin that uh, if you're of a mind, there's a place for you to take notes. Um, if you learned something this morning that you didn't know, write it down where it says head. If uh, you're called to believe something about God or Jesus, then write that down where it says heart. And take something with you. Um, it's not just for us to be followers of Jesus inside the safe confines of the church. It is for us to take this message of good news out into the world with us. So write that where it says hands. So there was a salty old sea captain and he was training a midshipman on his first cruise. And he said, now if a storm were to come upon us from the aft, what would you do? Sir, I would throw out an anchor. He said, sir, um, no, he said, the, the captain said to the, the midshipman again, so if a storm were to come to us from the port side, what would you do? do? I'd, sir, I'd throw out an anchor. And if it was to come to us, if you were sailing into a storm, what would you do? Sir, I would throw out an anchor. And the captain looked at him and said, young man, where are you getting all these anchors? And he said, I'm getting them in the same place you're getting all these storms, <laughs> sir. <laughs> we have a nautical theme this morning. The, the, um, sermon is entitled Soul Anchor, and we'll get to the soul anchor in a little bit. But um, the author to the letter of the Hebrews, uh, traditionally that was understood as Paul, but it looks nothing like any of other Paul's letters, and he doesn't claim authorship of that particular passage. Some think that it was Apollos, who was Jewish and uh, a very strong rhetorician and someone who really understood the Old Testament. So he makes his arguments about how Jesus is greater than the angels and Jesus is greater than the Old Testament patriarchs and the prophets. And he takes these pains throughout his letter to explain all this to us. And it assumes that we have some significant knowledge, some intimacy with the Old Testament scriptures. So we're going to start in the Old Testament this morning so that we can understand um, the, the letter of Hebrews argument. If you've got your Bibles, if you turn with me to Genesis chapter 15, Actually, chapter 12, we'll start there. And uh, you'll find that on page 8 if you're following along in your pew Bible. Um, if you've brought your own Bible, um, you're on your own. Abram was a pagan. Abram was married to Sarai. Abram grew up in the city of Ur of the Chaldees. And he lived there for a number of years. He was married for a number of years. And then in chapter 12, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. It's the beginning of this relationship between God and Abraham. Now we think that it's, it would be great to hear an audible voice of God in our ear. And Abraham, Abram has that experience. And yet, okay, he gets up from Ur of the Chaldees and he goes to Haran and he's there for a number of years. His father Terah dies in Haran um, and it's been 10 years since he's heard this word of the Lord. I'd rather have the scriptures. I can get out of bed in the morning and study the scriptures and read the scriptures and I have God's promises before me. Abram's got to remember this word that he had heard and it has been over a period of time. Flip a couple of pages for me if you would. At the end of chapter 14, um, Abraham, Abram is defending the land against the four kings and he has just concluded a battle and he has gone to bed and he is asleep and the Lord comes to him again at the beginning of chapter 15. And after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me, for I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household, a servant, will be my heir. God gives this promise to Abraham, Abram, over and over and over again. You will be a great nation. You will be as plentiful as the stars in the sky, and yet there is no evidence of that. In the ancient world, it was a curse to be barren, and Abram and Sarah were now in old age, and they had not had any children of their own. And so he's thinking that this promise will become true through his servant, and he will be the heir of this promise and heir of uh, God's blessings. But God says, no, not so much. Look at verses 4 and 5 of chapter 15. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. 
And he brought him outside and said, look toward the heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. God again reiterates this promise to a childless man and it has now been a number of years since the first time God made this promise. And he continues to reiterate this promise and yet there's no proof of this promise. Now here's the amazing thing. Look at verse five. And he brought him outside, I'm sorry, verse six. And he believed the Lord, Abram believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. There's no evidence and yet Abram believes. Now we don't know whether he mulled it over in his mind for a while and came to understand that God is gonna, he continues to reiterate this promise, maybe it'll happen, or whether it was an immediate assent to the word, the vision of God, or whether it was verbal or whether it was mental, we don't know, it doesn't tell us. What we do know is that he came to a place of faith. He believed this promise given to him by God. Sarah's still barren. There is still no child. There's a passage uh, in, in Paul in Romans 4 that I love. With regard to the promise of God, Abram did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, being fully convinced that what God had promised, he was able also to do. And if you read the story of Abraham, beginning at chapter 12 and all the way through to the end, it, it's hilarious. He didn't waver in unbelief. He wavered in unbelief all the time. He reaches the pinnacle of faith here. Abraham believed God and God reckoned it to him as righteousness, but he doesn't stay up on the pedestal. He doesn't stay at the pinnacle, at the mountaintop. He falls off the pinnacle, he falls off the pedestal, and that's the nature of our Christian lives. It's like being on a, in a rowboat at sea. Up we go and down we go and buffeted by the winds and the waves, and, and that's life in this world. And that was Abraham's experience, and yet, God made this promise of which there's no evidence of its fulfillment and he believed God and God reckoned it to him as righteousness. Flip a page, uh, page 11 in your pew Bible, uh, chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared again and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face and God said, Behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. God promises again and again. He's childless, there's no heir, uh, but he believed God and God reckoned it to him as righteousness. It's been 25 years since God began this process. 25 years of, he shows up periodically from time to time and he reiterates, he makes the promise to him again and again and again. Your offspring shall be as numerous as the stars in the heaven. Still no evidence of that happening. And this is before circumcision. There's no work to be done here. This is before the law was given. There's no law to follow here. Abraham believed God. It's faith in this God who makes promises. We live our lives the same way Abraham does. It's what takes place in our lives between the promise and the fulfillment. There's always a lapse of time. There's always uh, this period in which God is working on us. And if we read Abraham's life, he tells two kings that Sarah is his wife. He has Ishmael by Sarah's handmaiden because he couldn't figure out how else God was going to provide for him this son. And it's not just one mountaintop experience after another. It's up and down and back and forth, just like our lives. But God makes promises, and God is one who keeps his promise. 25 years after he began this process, God gives to Abraham and Sarah this son that he had promised, Isaac. His name means laughter. And they watched as Isaac grew. It says of Jesus in Luke's gospel that he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men, and that's how Isaac grew, the same way. And so here is the fulfillment of God's promise. And now turn with me to chapter 22. It's the craziest thing you're ever going to read. It's the craziest story that you're ever going to hear. Abraham, and he said, here I am. And God said, take your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. You know, God said of the Canaanite that they were a people of detestable practices. 
What he's commanding is child sacrifice. Take his young son, his firstborn. That was worship of the god Molech. They would take their firstborn son and pitch him on a bonfire and kill him. And here's God commanding something similar. Um, what on earth do you think is going through Abraham's mind? It's taken 25 years plus now. Uh, Isaac is a young man. It's taken 25 plus years to see the fulfillment and to believe that it's actually going to happen. And God says, no, bring him to Mount Moriah and offer him up as a burnt offering. Now, here's the amazing thing. And immediately, Abraham does as he was commanded. What? I don't know that any of us would do that. He does what he was commanded to do. How is it that he could do that? Well, our text tells us, verses 4 and 5, And on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes, and he saw the place from afar. And he said to his young men, Abraham had taken two servants with him, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come to you again. Now, he didn't know how that was going to work out. According to the author of the letter of Hebrews, he believed that God would raise him from the dead. He would, he would do what God commanded, and he believed that God would raise him from the dead. But what he told his servants is, we're going to go out of your sight, we're going to go and worship, and we will come back to you. And he left it in God's hands, how God was going to work this thing out. And so he begins this trek up Mount Moriah with his son of the promise. Can you imagine the conversation? There's no animal for this sacrifice. So Isaac begins to question his father, where, where is the sacrifice going to come from? And together they build the pyre upon which they're going to have this altar and sacrifice. And where is the ram? And it becomes clear that the ram, the, the offering, is this son of the promise. Do we love things more than we love God? Abraham loved his son Isaac. This was the fulfillment of all of his and Sarah's dreams and hopes. Can you imagine the pain in his heart, the nausea, the darkness, the, the brokenness? He's got to offer his son Isaac to God. And he goes up and he binds his son on the altar. And he is weeping and he is sobbing and he's kissing his son and telling him that he loves him and then he brings out the knife and holds it over his son and before he can plunge the knife into his son the angel of the Lord calls out Abram Abraham and stops him and we know what happens we know the rest of the story it has a happy ending but we didn't know that it would have a happy ending Abram believed God and God reckoned it to him as righteousness now this is the story this is the picture from the Old Testament that the author to the letter of Hebrews wants us to understand. And so in verse um, 16, after Abraham had obeyed God in this crazy fashion, God does something equally crazy. God says, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven. God takes an oath. God, in addition to his promise, adds the power of this oath. Now, what is oath taking about? You know, you, in old movies, I don't think we say it anymore, but in old movies, you put your hand on the Bible and promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. We swear by something greater than ourselves. We don't swear by, oh, by my guinea pig by my goldfish, by my ant farm. No, we swear by something that is greater than we are. And so God swears by the greatest thing in the universe. God swears by himself. Not only will I make this promise and reiterate this promise and remind you of the promise, but now I will take an oath and I will guarantee by my own name that I will fulfill everything that I have said. Now let's flip over to the New Testament passage, because this is where the author, he assumed that we knew all that, and I'm not sure that all of us knew all that, and now he begins to make his argument in the New Testament. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people... He's going to explain to us, why, why did God, why would God need to take an oath? It's like, why would Jesus, who is sinless, need to be baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River? 
It was a baptism of repentance for sin. Jesus wasn't sinful. Why would God take an oath? You know, God understands the human heart. We're cynical. We're suspicious. We're not fast to believe. We're slow to believe. And it takes a long track record for God to build up trust and faith in us. And so God says, I've made the promise, and you have believed, but I'm now making an oath that I am going to guarantee you everything that I promised I'm going to do. And, and so he says, for people swear by something greater than themselves. You know, in the Hebrew world, when you swore by God's name, that was it. Argument over, no more discussion about it. Because if you, di if you didn't keep your oath, it was a violation of the third commandment, that you will uh, not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, that you'll not misuse God's name. And God will be the one who will punish you if you break this oath. And so once an oath was taken, it was sealed and it was settled and it was believed and it was accepted. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs the promise of the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with the oath. So that by two unchangeable things, two unchangeable things, his promise. He made the same promise to Abraham over and over and over again. And as he reiterated that promise over and over and over again, there was no evidence of it. There was no sight of it. Sarai, Sarah was still barren. There was no child. 25 years from the beginning of the promise making until the promise was kept in the birth of Isaac. 25 years. The first is the promise. The second is the oath that God guarantees it by his own name so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. A strong encouragement, actually in the Greek, it's a strong, powerful encouragement. Why do we have hope? We have hope because of the promise of God. We have hope because of the oath that God has taken to see that this eternal covenant that he made with Abraham will find its fulfillment. And here you sit, and you're twinkling in the stars of the heavens because you are the spiritual offspring of Abraham. You are the proof positive of God's promise and of his oath. Verses 19 and 20. So we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor. It's a beautiful image. Um, in the ancient times when Christians were being persecuted, particularly in Rome, they would go underground and they would live in the catacombs. And the catacombs scratched on the walls have images of anchors, and particularly the Priscilla catacombs. There are over 60 anchors etched into the walls. It's a reference to this promise here. And so what is it exactly that God has promised? This is kind of difficult for us to get because we didn't grow up Jewish. We didn't grow up present in our midst. So here's what's going on. In the temple, the nation would gather to worship, and the priests would be at the altar of God. This is where the nation gathered to worship, and there was the golden candlestick and the altar of incense and the showbread laid out before them, a reminder of God's presence and a reminder of God's promises. And then behind that, behind the holy place, was the Holy of Holies. It's the place where the Ark of the Covenant and the presence of God resided. And it was behind a curtain. And no one could go in behind that curtain except the high priest and once a year on Yom Kippur, only once a year, could he intercede for the people once a year behind that curtain. And so this is the picture that he's drawing for us. So it's behind the curtain. We've got the, the holy place where the nation worships, and then we've got the presence of God in the holy of holies. That curtain was 10 inches thick. It was 60 feet tall and 30 feet wide, and it took 100 priests to lift it up off of the ground. It was, it was impossible for humanity to commune face to face with God. This barrier existed, and only the high priest representing the nation could go in there once a year. 
We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. So their image is, again, life storm-tossed and whipped about by the sea and the spray and the wind and the circumstances of life. And we have an anchor. And we don't throw our anchor into the depths. We throw our anchor through the curtain into the Holy of Holies where God resides. We throw it into the heavens. And it is anchored to the throne of God in the heavenly places. Paul says in Ephesians 1.3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. This anchor is anchored to the throne of God in the heavens. And then he continues, and this is even crazier and even better, but harder for the Jews to understand. A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. There's a hope. And it's not a what is the hope, it's a who is the hope. Who enters into the Holy of Holies? When Jesus died on the cross, he cried to Telestai, paid in full, to Telestai, it is finished. And as he gave up his life, as he gave up his soul, the curtain in the temple, 10 inches thick, big as that thing was, was torn in two. And God is saying, in effect, it's an open house. Everybody is welcome. Now you have access to me personally. It doesn't require the intermediary of a high priest, and it is perpetual and it is eternal that Jesus inaugurates for us. Jesus goes in ahead of us into this holy place where we can now have intimate access and intimate fellowship with God himself. It's a mind-blowing thing for a Hebrew Christian. And then verse 20, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner. Sadly, I'm a Maryland Terrapin football fan. And I go to Bird Stadium and watch the game, and um, the team gathers in the clubhouse uh, at one end of the stadium. And as they run out onto the field, there is a 300-pound bronze Terrapin there named Testudo. And as they run by, they polish his nose on their way out to the field. And uh, at the gateway is uh, an arch in Maryland colors. And then the cheerleaders would make a banner, and it would say something creative like, win, <laughs> go team, endeavor fellows. And so this banner comes across this arch, and the first player runs out through and rips the banner and runs out onto the field, and then all of his teammates and coaches follow behind him. That's the picture that this author of the letter of Hebrews is painting for us. That Jesus is the first one out on the field. Jesus is the one to burst through the banner. He is our forerunner. He leads us into the Holy of Holies. He leads us into the presence of Christ. These promises, the, this oath that God took, is a promise of hope, a promise of faith, a promise of fellowship with God himself where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. I'm not going to go into Melchizedek, but what we need to know is that he is, Jesus is our high priest. He's burst through the banner. He's seated at the right hand of God. Hebrews says in chapter 7 that he lives always to make intercession for us. We have a high priest who is our priest perpetually. We have a high priest who is our priest eternally. He's living right now at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. And he is where our anchor is anchored, where it is set. And we have access to the person and the presence and the holiness of God. And it's available to every one of us. If, like Abraham, we will believe the promises that God has made to us, it is offered to us. It's sure. It's anchored in heaven where Jesus intercedes for us. It's sure it's anchored in Jesus who is our forerunner, the one who bursts the banner, the one who leads us into the presence of God. Now, if Apollos was writing this letter today instead of 2,000 years ago, he might not use Abraham as the one who is the uh, paragon of faith, the paragon of belief. He might use for us Larry and Jan that they have weathered the storms of life. They have demonstrated and modeled for us faithfulness and faith in Jesus Christ. 
and Al and Joanne snuck in. It would be true for them as well. They're seated way back up in the corner because it's not their day, but they're here. Um, God, the, the author would write a letter about Al and Joanne and Larry and Jan, that they are the ones who modeled for us and showed us the way to follow Jesus and how to be with him in good times and as well as you all know, in bad times as well. That God is one who is faithful and God keeps his promises by his oath and greater than his oath, he keeps his promises in his son, Jesus Christ.